the people dialing in to settle down a bit so we can actually get started. Um, so, okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to today's uh, CNCF webinar, Accelerate Containerized Application Delivery Using Kubernetes on the AWS Cloud. Um, I am the Kubernetes Community Manager at Red Hat um, and a CNCF Ambassador. Um, I will be moderating today's webinar and I want to go ahead and uh, welcome our team of presenters today. So we have Brent Smithurst, um, the Cloud Application and Product Marketing Manager. So our panel are all from uh, Suzy, uh, which is Suzy Inc. now. Um, anyway, Suzy. Um, and um, the, um, which is, uh, so I'm gonna, so Brent Smithers is the Cloud Application Platform Marketing Manager. Troy Topnick, the Cloud Application Platform Product Manager. Hello. Andrew Gracely. Uh, the technical marketing manager and Kevin Ayers, the cloud solutions architect. Um, uh, Hello all. Yep. Um, are a, a power team from Suze. Thanks, Josh. The, um, so, um, and as I said, I'm Josh Berkus. Um, you've seen me in some of these other webinars and you will see me again. Now, there are a few other housekeeping um, items. First of all, you may have noticed if you dialed in for this that you are muted and you cannot unmute yourself. Um, the way to ask questions is there should be a Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Open that up and then we'll open up a panel um, that allows you to ask questions. Uh, some of the questions will be answered by the panelists um, or by a member of the CNCF team um, uh, via text in the screen. Others will be answered out loud at the end of the presentation. Um, you can ask questions in the chat window, but we don't pay as much attention to the chat window, which means those questions might not be seen. Um, so, uh, the, um, so make sure that if you have a question that you really want answered that you add second in that Q&A panel. If you do have technical problems with participating, like the Q&A panel does not work for you, et cetera, um, then go ahead and uh, a chat directly, uh, Taylor Wagoner, um, uh, who will try to fix that for you. Um, one other uh, important thing, this is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Um, in short, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. And with that, I will turn it over to the Suze team to kick off today's presentation. So Brent, you wanna take it away? Great, thanks Josh. Hello everybody. Uh, the team here at SUSE is really excited to talk to you and demonstrate our solution to you today. So I'll kick things off in just a minute by giving you a brief introduction to SUSE Cloud Application Platform and the challenges it solves for our users. We'll follow that with some more technical information, including a general solution architecture and a demo by Troy and Andrew, so you can see for yourselves how the platform works. And finally, Kevin will wrap things up before questions by um, telling you how the platform operates on AWS specifically and he'll demonstrate a quick start we have available to get you up and running and using the platform as easily as possible. So the reason SUSE Cloud Application Platform exists is pretty simple. Most of our team has a background in providing tools for developers. And we noticed that while Kubernetes is the dominant container management platform for operators, it doesn't offer much for developers who write and create containerized applications. However, there is a complementary technology out there that does offer that, and our team has a lot of experience with it. And that's why SUSE Cloud Application Platform chose to use the Cloud Foundry application runtime to add functionality for developers on top of Kubernetes. So you may have heard about Cloud Foundry in the past, and you may have some preconceived notions about it. 
whether that's the case or not, I'd just like you to hear us out because what we offer is unique. It's a 100% open source project that containerizes the Cloud Foundry application runtime and runs it inside of any Kubernetes distribution. So there's no virtual machines involved. And best of all, there's no Bosch. So what the product does is it allows developers to containerize, deploy, run, and manage an application using a single CF push command from the CLI, or even by specifying a Git repo in the UI. From there, it automatically identifies and pulls in the required language libraries, frameworks, and other dependencies via a technology called build packs, which are open source and are now part of the CNCF. There are also open source service brokers to automatically create and bind services to applications. And then once the application is deployed, the platform automates lifecycle management to the app by assigning appropriate resources, managing routing, load balancing, scaling it up and down as required, and much more. So the platform eliminates manual IT configuration and helps accelerate innovation by getting applications to market faster. That's Sort of marketing speak there, I had to throw that in, but uh, it is true, that's what it does. Developers serve themselves and can get apps to the cloud in minutes instead of weeks, all while staying within IT guidelines and without relying on scarce IT resources to perform manual configuration each step of the way. And again, it does it all within Kubernetes, which more and more organizations are already using. The key features and benefits include boosting developer productivity with that one-step application deployment I talked about. Again, you just push an application with a command, platform automatically configures the environment, provides the dependencies, binds the services, and deploys the app as a container, which is then automatically managed and scaled inside Kubernetes. It increases efficiency by running in lightweight containers instead of resource-hungry virtual machines consumes a fraction of the memory footprint of other distros while being as fast or faster to recover and scale. It's fault tolerant, self healing, high availability for all critical components. And the platform monitors the health of all containers and automatically restarts failed ones. And finally, it maximizes ROI by using industry leading open source technologies. So again, it's 100% open source, it includes SUSE Linux Enterprise, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, Stratos UI, um, some bits from Helm and, and some other things. But I don't want you to just take my word for it of all the benefits. There are studies by the Cloud Foundry Foundation that show how organizations dramatically decrease the time it takes to deploy apps after they adopt the Cloud Foundry. So before a typical user deployed and configured cloud apps manually, or using custom install, install scripts or configuration management tools. Under those workflows, 51% of respondents required more than three months to deploy a, a new cloud application. Only 16% say it took them less than a week. But after moving those apps to Cloud Foundry application runtime, those times dropped dramatically. Now 46% of respondents report cloud app development cycles of under a week including 25% who report it takes less than one day. And the other key finding of the survey was that organizations can now deliver more apps in less time. So more than a third of users save a few months or more per development cycle, 10% report saving more than six months. Nearly a quarter of users report saving $500,000 per application development cycle. And on average, they reported savings of 10 weeks of time and $100,000 per development cycle. So what that means is that an app a year company can transform into an app a week company, and that has a compounding effect when it comes to saving time and money. So that's why SUSE Cloud Application Platform uses Cloud Foundry. It's a certified distribution that is containerized and very easy for Kubernetes users to get started with. Compared to other non-containerized distros with a much smaller memory footprint, again, are 100% open source, and of course use SUSE Enterprise Linux. So now I'll just hand it over to Troy Topnik. He'll give you some more technical info and then uh, kick into a demo with Andrew. Troy? Yeah, thanks, Brent. 
So uh, when we were designing the solution, we were very mindful of the fact that uh, there are different audiences involved for using Kubernetes. There's the operators who are interested in creating a fabric to run all their application workloads on, but there's also the users that have to interact with it uh, to get their applications there, to actually stand things up, to deliver business value. And we understand that there's a variety, uh, a sort of a spectrum of familiarity with Kubernetes. And different organizations are gonna, and different parts of an organization are gonna choose to deploy applications uh, differently. So uh, we wanted to be sure when we made this solution that uh, people could use the CF push experience for um, a more streamlined developer experience to deploying typical web applications. But we wanted to leave, make sure we left room for um, people with more DevOps ops experience, people who weren't afraid of the Kubernetes learning curve to be able to deploy applications directly to. So uh, cloud application platform always makes sure that we've got the Kubernetes API and the Cloud Foundry API exposed and that we've created an interface for this. Additionally, um, though uh, SUSE has a Kubernetes distribution, SUSE CAS platform, we recognize that uh, some organizations, some customers already have uh, Kubernetes or have get Kubernetes from a cloud provider like Amazon EKS. Um, so we made this flexible so that you can choose to install it on a completely SUSE stack or mix and match. You can install just SUSE CAS platform dealing just with the uh, Kubernetes API and the, the variety of uh, development and deployment tools that are available from the community, or you can combine it with uh, SUSE Cloud Application flat Platform. Alternatively, if you uh, want to run it on any Kubernetes, we can do that too. We support, um, we have deep support for Amazon EKS, uh, Azure uh, AKS, and Google GKE, as well as CAS Platform. But if it meets the minimum requirements, SUSE Cloud Application Platform will run on any Kubernetes. So another cool uh, component of this puzzle is the Open Service Broker API. This is an API that is used to expose services either within Kubernetes or to Cloud Foundry applications. And using this, we can uh, expose to users of our platform either uh, services that we provide through our MIDI broker, which deploys service instances using Helm, or ties in to the host uh, Kubernetes is maybe they have a cloud service provider has an existing uh, service broker such as the AWS service broker. So if you run it uh, on Amazon EKS, you can tie into all of the hosted services on Amazon like Amazon RDS, EMR, et cetera. Um, these are available really no matter where you uh, run your applications, provided you have a good connection and, and network line of sight. So here's a very simplified view of uh, SUSE Cloud application platform running on, on some Kubernetes. We have roles in the system, which are inherited from Cloud Foundry. Uh, they're part of a, any certified distri uh, distribution of Cloud Foundry. We have a broker, uh, for example, our mini broker, UAA handling authentication uh, for the system, volume management, uh, a router to control ingress to the applications, CC APIs, the cloud controller API, which is sort of the brains of the operation and, and logging subsystems as well. And what is shown above this is interesting uh, in terms of the history of Cloud Foundry. We have uh, these things in the darker green which are called Diego cells. And they have traditionally been the things that run applications within this context. Um, Diego is a container scheduler that uh, predated Kubernetes and is now, uh, in some sense, has been uh, superseded by Kubernetes. So what we're doing at SUSE is working to transition from schedulers within Kubernetes that are actually Diego to uh, integrating a new technology called Irene, which I'll talk about in a second, which runs the applications as Kubernetes native pods. So Cloud Foundry just becomes a gateway to deploying your cloud native applications on Kubernetes. 
So these projects um, are driven largely by SUSE. Uh, these are ones that are happening upstream in the Cloud Foundry Foundation to move <coughs> the, the uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime into uh, a future that is completely Kubernetes native, as that's where the industry has gone. So SUSE uh, already has, obviously, a cloud application platform, which is deployed to Kubernetes using Helm. But we're also part of an upstream project to uh, integrate Kubernetes operator to make uh, lifecycle management of Cloud Foundry inside Kubernetes much easier. This project has a lot of components which could be generally useful to the, the wider Kubernetes community. But right now, we're focusing on making the management experience for operators of Cloud Foundry excellent inside, um, inside, Cloud, in, inside Kubernetes. The IREDI project, which we work on with IBM, um, is the component which I mentioned earlier, which replaces the Diego scheduler uh, with Kubernetes. Now, this actually uh, involves some other subtle changes within uh, Cloud Foundry uh, to give it an orchestrator provider interface. So, in the future, it will be possible to substitute uh, for other uh, scheduling engines. Uh, there's been some experimentation done, for example, with Knative uh, for scheduling uh, Cloud Foundry applications. So, Irene is bringing uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime uh, fully into uh, the Kubernetes community. And all of the Cloud Foundry uh, vendors are actually actively involved in this project. But the one uh, that we are probably most proud of because it uh, works so well and it was very warmly accepted by, by the community is Stratos. Stratos is a web UI that was designed from the ground up to be uh, an AP, a multi-API, multi-endpoint, multi-cloud uh, control uh, interface for initially Cloud Foundry, but now other cloud native APIs such as Kubernetes, uh, and uh, we'll even show some Helm integration coming up. Uh, for those of you who are interested in what we just released uh, the other day, um, we've been, uh, uh, we've had this uh, uh, product out for a number of months now. And uh, 1.5 has just been released, and we've added a few uh, useful things, Terraform scripts for not only deploying it on AWS, Azure, and G GCP, but actually setting up uh, Kubernetes on those platforms appropriately to run a uh, cloud application platform. In, in the Stratos UI, we've added a Helm interface so you can browse charts and deploy them. We'll show that. Uh, App Autoscaler uh, is uh, there are features now exposed in the interface which uh, allow you to set parameters for the scaling of applications based on uh, throughput, uh, CPU usage, memory usage, that sort of thing, or, or a schedule, a scheduler, um, to scale up and down the application instances to, uh, to cope with load. And uh, we've added more to the Stratos metrics component, which is a, a a deployment that is uh, pushed alongside of Stratos to provide a Prometheus database to uh, track the metrics over time for, um, for display to the users. Without further ado, I think we should get into showing this. I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Andrew Gracie to bring up his screen. Cool. And Thank you, Troy. Walk us through uh, the experience of using this. Right. Uh, so I'm hoping to show today that uh, just how easy it is to deploy an application uh, using cloud application platform. Um, so what I've got is the first thing that I'm going to show is from the command line. Um, and what I have downloaded is an application that is the 12 factor application, uh, just a demo app showing how to do 12 factor. Um, and the only modification that we have to do is add in this manifest.yaml. So let me go ahead and show what that is. It's a very short manifest, basically showing, hey, here's the name. Uh, you can add in uh, uh, memory and disk quotas, uh, what stack you want to do, and as well as a, the, what build pack you want to use. Uh, once you have that set up, all you have to do 
is type in CF push, and then it will take care of the rest of this for you. Uh, there's no messing around with YAML except for the manifest. You don't have to worry about uh, Kubernetes deployments, uh, anything. Yeah, basically it will do everything for you. So this uh, is, uh, it's good to mention exactly what's happening here. Yeah. Uh, we, so it's good. Go ahead. Oh, I was about to say, so yeah, so what it does is it uh, tars up um, your directory, pushes it over to, um, to Cloud Application Platform, which then uh, will unzip it and uh, run a build pack on it. Uh, so the build pack will pull down all of the, um, all the dependencies, uh, will turn that into a droplet, which then gets built into a container. And then um, Kubernetes will take that container, pull it down and run it uh, based on the, the settings that it has. Yeah, so, build, packs, build packs are kind of like a, a generic pipeline. So uh, whereas ordinarily uh, with a CI CD system, you would build a pipeline specific for your app. Here we have a build pack that can adapt to applications of a certain type with different dependencies. And so it will install the correct version of Ruby, the correct version of the gems uh, automatically. It can either detect what kind of application uh, you're pushing or you can specify uh, in the manifest YAML file which build pack to use. And it's already running. So we, yeah, that's, exactly. that's all we had to do. And there's a huge amount of customization that you can do inside of that manifest uh, to really um, make it exactly what you need it to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, copy out this route and show that it is indeed running. And there we go. We've got our tool factor app running. Uh, this command line uh, can do a bunch of different things in, as well as uh, it can show you what all you're actually running as well as a, a huge amount of uh, features. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I'm actually gonna switch over to our UI, um, our graphical UI uh, that is Stratos. Um, so here what you see on the screen is our Stratos UI. Uh, the homepage for it. So we can favorite all of the pieces that we have. And this is actually connected to uh, several different clouds. Uh, so we've got uh, two um, EKS clusters running, as well as a Cloud Foundry that's also running in the IBM Cloud. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so you can actually manage uh, multiple clusters through this one UI. Um, so you can see I'm going to click through and show a few of these pieces that you have. Sorry. If I can just sidebar on this a little bit, for, yeah. uh, Andrew, this is an adaptive UI that uh, will show you, A, what you're connected to, and B, what you're allowed to see uh, through the permission controls uh, of the system. So we've connected to a number of uh, Cloud Foundry endpoints, or two Cloud Foundry endpoints. And uh, in one of them, we're connected as a regular user. We have limited permissions. We can only do basically what you saw Andrew do from the command line. You can deploy applications, you can request services. But um, uh, the others, we're connected as an administrator. So uh, it can tell, based on the credentials you use to connect to the various endpoints, what permissions you have, and it will expose only those in uh, the interface. Likewise, the items you see on the left-hand side are exposed like the Cloud Foundry uh, component, Kubernetes and Helm, it will expose those based on what endpoints you have uh, connected. So let's go to the top level applications view here and we actually see an aggregation of all of the applications that were deployed to all of the endpoints that we specified. So we can see in the top left corner where it says Cloud Foundry there, we can click on that and we can take a look at a specific endpoint. This is one that Andrew set up that is running Irene, so with uh, Kubernetes native application scheduling. And then the other one is one that I set up also on Amazon, and that's running uh, in the Diego architecture. And it's the same. The user experience is the same. Uh, the API interactions are the same, and we can dig in. And, and let's take a look at one of these applications to see uh, what's there. So this is the 12-factor one that he just uh, uh, set up, we can see how many instances we're running. I think when we push, uh, go ahead and select instances there. We can easily scale uh, either with the auto scaler or manually. We can SSH into application instances um, to uh, 
to debug things. This is particularly useful for debugging. We can, which it's not doing right now. I think this is because you just scaled it. I, I did not pray to pray <laughs> to the demo gods. Okay, <laughs> to, uh, click back to the 12 factor view. We'll show it in a different app. Um, we can see the routes that are assigned. Now, uh, this system will automatically assign routes based on a, a base domain. You can, uh, as an organization manager, add other uh, domains to this, but we're just gonna add another host name. So we've got another route to it. This is excellent for A-B testing and quickly surfacing uh, things. We can actually deploy multiple applications with the same route um, so that uh, we can switch between blue-green deployments. Uh, that's a technique that's, that's often used. Uh, the log stream, uh, this is the same as you would see from the CLI uh, after he does a push. Um, we would have, we would have, if we'd clicked over here, seen the staging process. But now we see uh, what's happening with this application. If we uh, uh, hit this uh, URL, we would see uh, more logs. So this is anything from that application that goes to standard out or standard error would appear here. We can also set a configuration parameter to add specific log files to this stream, and this is available through the, the web UI or the CLI. Services. Um, we could add a service here, I think. Take a look at the marketplace services. Let's go to a different uh, app, perhaps. No, we can, we can show marketplace services. Okay, here. good, good. <laughs> so <laughs> Andrew's actually hooked this up very cleverly to open FAS uh, to show how you can actually surface the function as a service uh, containers as services exposed by an open service broker API. This is genius, I think. I don't know if we can demo this, but- uh, I, I can't demo it yet. <laughs> typically, this is used for, um, uh, for connecting an application to a database. And we can show, for example, the currency app later uh, that, uh, that has this connection. Yeah, not gonna have that up today. Do you want, we can show uh, creating the, the MongoDB block. That's an excellent so you can create idea. applications through here, uh, through if you want to hook up to GitHub uh, or GitLab, or really any uh, Git or application uh, archive file. So you're able to deploy directly through Stratos. Uh, so I can go ahead and I'm going to deploy um, onto my own uh, Cloud Foundry uh, from, from GitHub directly. So if I click through here I, and I go and I type in um, my namespace, I can actually see that it will auto-populate all the projects that I have inside of my GitHub. Uh, this is done through the GitHub API and I'm going to use the uh, MongoDB blog. If I click click on next, it will actually show me and allow me to pick which commit I want. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick the latest because I know it works. And give, and so you saw the manifest earlier uh, for the 12 factor app. Uh, this actually allows you to come in and um, put an overlay on that so you can change um, any of the parameters that you need. So I'm just going to give it a different name. Let's see. Uh, blog demo, scroll down. And you'll see that it uh, pulls from Git and then uh, does a CF push uh, exactly as if you were on the command line. Um, and as soon as it gets uh, to where it knows that it's going to start uh, be pulling up, we can... Uh, yeah, go ahead and switch to the app, uh, app summary view. We can see the same logs in the log stream view uh, that we saw in the deployment view. Um, we're actually going to need for this application, we should do this quickly because uh, we're running out of time, okay. but uh, uh, we can select from the marketplace um, the service that we need. Oh. In this case, we're gonna need MongoDB. 409 should work. And we're gonna, should uh, give it a refresh. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah, okay. That's what we need. 
just call it, yeah. And now that will inject, <laughs> that will not only start in this case, uh, an instance uh, via Helm of uh, MongoDB, it will actually pass the connection credentials uh, returned by that deployment to uh, the application and expose it in the variables fields uh, in a special VCAP services uh, uh, environment variable which the app can consume. And the build pack will generally speaking know how to uh, modify the application to connect to this database. If it isn't, then uh, there's some simple techniques you can use to, uh, to expose those credentials to the app. So let's, now, uh, let me go ahead and show the Helm uh, features real fast. Yeah, so uh, we connected uh, this to a few different Helm repositories, the upstream stable, um, and uh, this is a charts repo. Uh, we can browse them here and we can try, uh, try installing Aerospike. Uh, it'll pull in the readme so you can see the documentation for any given uh, uh, Helm chart. Uh, we can select which cluster that we're connected to we want to uh, deploy to and uh, give it a name. We'll put it in the default namespace for now. Okay. And uh, this is cool. So those of you who've used uh, Helm before, sometimes where do you start with a blank page? Well, you can just copy in the, the default values YAML so you can see what, uh, what uh, options are there for you to edit and modify. We'll leave this one as it is and we'll just install. Um, questions from the field. There are some questions in the q and uh, We'll get to those uh, at the end of the session. We, we're not, all of them are good. Um, and we might uh, switch, switch back to, to make sure we cover those. Sure. Uh, there's the deployment. Uh, click on the notes so we can see the output of uh, Helm. Uh, that's how to connect to it, how to use it. You can actually insert these into uh, 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 VCAP services if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see the pods that are running, but let's look at a more uh, complex application, maybe one that's already been uh, deployed such as SCF. SCF, uh, short for SUSE Cloud Foundry, and it's uh, one of the main components of Cloud Application Platform. Uh, we can see, uh, oh, no, this is the console clicked, itself. I clicked on the wrong thing, yeah. You click SCF. There we go. There we go. So those are the containers that are actually providing the platform functionality. And we can see, my favorite, you can dig into the pods, um, the, the values, see what values we deployed with, and uh, see the services that it's exposing within Kubernetes. So if you uh, just wanna click on endpoints so we can, we can wrap this up uh, and show how easy it is for people to install it on uh, AWS. The design of the system is meant to be extensible. Uh, we started with Cloud Foundry, we moved on to Kubernetes, we've recently added Helm and uh, adding more and more metrics functionality uh, as we go. Uh, we're really aiming for this to be uh, a true hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, multi-API interface so you can manage all your cloud applications in one place. And uh, I think it's coming along nicely there. I hope you enjoy it. So uh, why don't we hand this back over? We can come back to this later if we have questions about specifics. Why don't we uh, hand this over to Kevin? Uh, to talk a little bit about how we've worked with AWS to make it easy to, uh, to get started on this uh, in that public cloud. Thank you, Troy and Andrew. Um, let's see, let me grab the deck and reshare that deck, sorry. Uh, Brent, can you continue to advance slides, please? Here we go, Thank Kevin. You. Appreciate that. So for about 10 years, we've been working hand in hand with AWS, helping literally uh, thousands of businesses move their enterprise workloads to the, to the cloud. Um, we collaborate with uh, AWS solutions architects and build certified well-architected solutions, uh, which means among other things that it follows industry best practices for security and high availability. 
Um, today, obviously, we've got an ideal platform for deploying and running mission-critical microservice workloads on the Elastic Kubernetes service, uh, which is uh, AWS's native, uh, it, their native Kubernetes uh, service. And we also have a long history of, of this relationship with SAP workloads on AWS and a very mature support process in place. And this is really key that when you work with SUSE and AWS together, it's, it's a very well-built, well-supported solution. And let's go to the next slide and I'll go ahead and take a peek at this architecture. So we had an opportunity to um, build this quick start with AWS solutions architects. And uh, very simply, it deploys cloud application platform uh, across three availability zones using auto scaling groups, uh, deploys uh, one or more bastion hosts, and uses elastic load balancing, uh, as well as a number of other native services, including the AWS master Kubernetes service, EKS. Uh, the solution deploys using SUSE. Uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server Worker Nodes, which is, uh, which is key. And um, go ahead, uh, at the end of the session, there are links. Um, please do follow those links. Look at the Quick Start architecture and you get, a, get a deeper dive. Um, next slide, let me go ahead and share the, um, I'll show you a quick demo of this quick start. Uh, if you go to aws.amazon.com slash quick start, filter by containers and microservices, we're right there. You can go ahead and launch that. And viewing the deployment guide is key. I encourage everyone to, to peruse that. It's, it's very interesting. We're gonna go ahead and skip down to how to deploy. And this is a way for you to get a cloud application platform running in 45 minutes or less. We're going to notice I'm, uh, hold on, let me move my, my Zoom controls somewhere else. Uh, notice I'm already logged in um, so that when I go to launch into a new VPC, choose a, a geo that I, I know I have available resources in and the CloudFormation template's already populated. I'm gonna click next. I'm gonna name it. I'm going to go ahead and insert a couple of key parameters that are required. I've already created a domain in Route 53, but you can also use your own domain through your, your external registrar. And grab an SSH, SSH key I've already created, choose three or more availability zones, uh, grab a remote access CIDR. I encourage everyone to limit this uh, as much as possible. A little more instead of my whole block and a number of configurable parameters. Uh, if you want your worker, if you want a little more oomph on your worker load, Worker nodes, you can you can size those up. You can, uh, because this is Diego cell based in its current form, there are two auto scaling groups, one for Diego nodes and one for uh, application worker nodes. Um, we, can, we can double those if we want, et cetera. We'll just go with the defaults for now. If you have additional uh, EKS admins, you want to be able to remotely uh, manage the EKS cluster, you can go ahead and, add their, uh, their resource names there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say yes to enable Stratos. Add some tags so I can find this later. Agree to a couple things, create the stack. Takes about 45 minutes, a little less. Um, going to just move over to a stack that I've already created. And if we see 
let me just refresh this. So this is a, a cap stack that I created just recently. Um, we can simplify the view, remove the nested stacks. Uh, there, there are two parent stacks that are called. One is cap, uh, cloud application platform. The other is the EKS control plane, which is the master uh, EKS service. Um, a key component, well, let's see, we can take a look at the resources that are built. Um, but the key component is the outputs. The outputs give you your Stratos console endpoint, your CF API endpoint, etc. cetera. Um, uh, there's our kubeconfig path, the bucket, and all of that's right there. Um, we can take our Str Stratos console endpoint, move over to that, log into Stratos. So very simple way to get up and running with Cloud Application Platform on, on AWS. And um, let's go ahead, let me drop this share so we can go to the, next, the last slide, Brent. Do you want to share? Great, thanks. And so, you know, what are next steps? Um, we definitely encourage everyone to check out the quick start guide um, and apply for AWS credits for qualified VOC and pilot projects. Visit the solution space. Um, the cloud application platform documentation is very interesting. The deployment guide com covers a number of things, as Troy mentioned, uh, beyond, beyond AWS and EKS. Uh, it, it covers other clouds, it covers on-prem, etc. cetera. So uh, a good, good resource there. Um, some of the open source projects that, were, that are involved in this. And any questions at all, go ahead and email us. AWS at SUSE.com goes to the entire uh, cloud solution provider team at SUSE, and we'll answer those questions. Um, so let's leave this up and go to questions. And thank you all. We've had some really inter interesting questions, which I've been uh, trying to answer um, online and, and type them out. But I want to call out some of the ones that I've, I've tried to answer here uh, so we can talk about them. Um, uh, Stoyan asks, is there tenant isolation? Can devs have access to the UI with limited view of their resources only and look at logs for troubleshooting purposes? Yes. Um, an enthusiastic yes, and this is one of the great things that using Cloud Foundry application runtime brings to Kubernetes because it's, it's it, role-based access controls are, are tricky in Kubernetes and it's, it's hard to do this kind of thing. So every uh, user in uh, a cloud Foundry system or a cloud application platform sy uh, system will be uh, assigned permissions within an org and permissions within a space within that org. So that's the, the sort of organizational structure for people within a Cloud Foundry system. And within an org, you can uh, have an org manager that sets permissions on what they can do. The, the total system administrator can assign certain permissions to that org manager, and that org manager in turn can assign permissions to the members of that organization and delineate uh, which spaces they have access to. Uh, basically, within a space, uh, all permissions are shared. Uh, two developers that have access to the same space will be able to uh, perform the same operations on applications within that if they are both have developer permissions. There's also an auditor permission if you just want to be able to check on the metrics, for instance. So there's very, very granular control um, uh, of the permissions users have when they get into the system and very, very good isolation uh, between the containers uh, on uh, within that system. So uh, they have very limited network um, egress within the cluster uh, connecting to uh, services uh, has to be explicitly allowed in a, a security group within the system so so there's a lot of tools that you can use uh, to uh, preserve tenant isolation uh, Stoyan also asks is uh, there's memory and disk quotas again these can be assigned per org or per space uh, what about CPU quotas? Well, that's actually not available in the API. We've, we, you saw we had some, some uh, 
some CPU uh, usage scaling criteria, so we can monitor that, but uh, that is not part of uh, quotas at, at, at the moment uh, in the system. So we, uh, we could look at bringing that uh, upstream because I know it's a concern, noisy neighbors, people who will hog all, you know, one application that would hog all the CPU to the detriment of other tenants. There are things you can do when you set up a system to minimize the chances of that happening, but uh, it's not actually exposed in the API. Um, Stoyan again, source for all these great questions. Um, what's the storage pack end? Uh, whatever you've set up with Kubernetes. In the case of uh, EKS, it's G, uh, GPU. Actually, I'd like to expand on uh, Stoyanov's question uh, mm -hmm. here, um, which is, um, in answering this question, can you also go a little bit more into how sort of Cloud Foundry works with CSI, which is the storage you know, interface for Kubernetes? Um, I, the, um, cause I don't, I haven't seen activity within the Kubernetes community on any specific CSI drivers for, um, Cloud Foundry. Um, and so I'm wondering how those work together. Uh, we inherit, uh, what the, what the cube cluster. And I mean, it, some, somebody can jump in and correct me here. Um, uh, uh, and my, my understanding might be a little bit limited, but, uh, in every case that I've encountered, uh, we just use the storage class that is set up uh, in Kubernetes. So of course, uh, on EKS, we're using GP2. Uh, we could set it up with NFS, for instance, uh, with another Kubernetes. Um, and the, the, the decision of which storage class and how that storage class is, is implemented is at the Kubernetes level. So that's not uh, directly related to, to this. We have to be flexible with what we can use. Okay, However, so it, if you have multiple storage classes, you can pick yeah. the yeah. one that you want to use. Okay. So it's a pass through then. Yep. Um, how, what do people do if they're on um, a local or bare metal cloud? Uh, you can attach to, well, you can set up, uh, for example, SUSE Enterprise Storage can, can be exposed. Um, if you want to use, we, we discourage people from using uh, HostPath uh, unless uh, on all but the simplest single node uh, deployments. Uh, uh, so that's, that's not really useful for, for, this, uh, for this scenario. But uh, yeah, you can connect to uh, network attached storage, for example, uh, Ceph can, uh, can be exposed as a storage class. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Roy asks, do you need to set up uh, AWS EKS cluster before you uh, install SUSE Cloud Application Platform? Uh, shorter answer is yes. Longer answer is we've made these Terraform scripts to do that for you. Uh, you set some parameters about what kind of cluster you need, and it will roll all the way through from setting up um, a cluster on EKS or AKS or GKE, and then doing a Helm install uh, and final configuration of cloud application platform. Um, uh, an anonymous user asks, which Kubernetes can we use? I think we covered that. Uh, we do all our testing on CAS platform, uh, GKE, AKS, EKS, uh, but we can support others. And if uh, your Kubernetes matches uh, our minimum requirements, which you can see, if you can have a look in the SCF uh, repository there on that last slide, um, you, can, uh, you can see there's a test script to see if Kubernetes is in uh, is is going to be compatible with cloud application platform. Uh, Devandra asks about running uh, uh, cloud application platform on Fargate. We haven't tried that yet. That's an interesting question. Um, it hasn't come up. This is the first time it's come up, but it's uh, it's uh, I'm not sure it would work, but that's just because we haven't looked at it. Um, also, another anonymous question is what the what the performance overhead of running uh, CF uh, on Kubernetes uh, as, as uh, opposed to CF on bare metal, uh, if I understood the question correctly. Um, it's hard to, to benchmark that because it's, it's actually very hard to install Cloud Foundry on bare metal. Bosch can do it. Um, uh, we don't typically see it in the field. Uh, we have a lot of comparisons of performance uh, of uh, uh, Cloud Foundry deployed on VMs versus Kubernetes. Um, uh, Cloud application platform running on Kubernetes is, is more performant at smaller scales, and they sort of 
uh, move to parity as the, as, the, as the systems get much larger. So those are the ones that I answered. There were some other ones that just came in. I'll try and uh, do it on the fly here. Uh, is pricing for EKS control planes still in place or is it going off? Don't know if I understand that. Kevin? I, I don't think that's a question you actually can't answer. That's a, yeah. it's an AWS pricing question. So <laughs> that's there, one, that's one. there is a cost for, for using the, the EKS control plane, uh, for using the EKS master service. Um, but again, that, that goes back to AWS. I, uh, it's, it's, it's not a significant cost you know, in terms of the overall uh, solution, so. Um, I want to get back to uh, another question from Stoyan. What do the app endpoints translate to in EKS, for instance? Is it an ELB? If so, is it a shared among all apps, individual LB per app, or is it configurable? The uh, ELB fronts a component called the Go router. Um, that's uh, what it is right now. It, it uh, will be... Um, replaced at some point in, in Core Cloud Foundry with uh, Istio and Envoy uh, when it is as performant as the Go router. So the uh, ELB hands off to the router, which uh, in turn is, uh, it does host and uh, path management um, for the system. So the Go router will handle all, um, all ingress into the system. Hopefully that, uh, that answers the question. Okay. Do, 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 do. Sajid has a good question. I just don't know if I can answer it. Uh, does EKS facilitate provisioning multiple Kubernetes master nodes to avoid single points of failure as far as the Kubernetes cluster is concerned? Uh, yeah. Again, that's an AWS question. Um, but I think it does. I mean, you're consuming Kubernetes as a service and they have certain guarantees about how highly available that is. I think behind the scenes, it is, there is some, uh, some high availability built in, but it is a, yeah, you're right. It is a, an Amazon question. Um, okay, I, uh, there's a question about compatibility with AWS ECS, um, if there is any. Um, again, uh, it's uh, it's like Fargate. We haven't uh, we haven't actually tried it yet, so you can't answer that. Uh, I don't believe it's compatible. Um, and then Stoyanov has another question here. I don't actually understand the question, so I'm hoping that you do. Out of the box, what does CAP do for preventing, pre, uh, preventing privilege escalation within the pod? On my cluster, I use PSP to set limits properly. Does CAP rely on underlying Kubernetes cluster configuration or is it manageable via CAP? It relies on the under, uh, underlying Kubernetes cluster configuration, but there are additional restrictions on what an application within Cloud Foundry can do. And that's an entire webinar in itself to explain the security groups and uh, the configuration of the base container image that, uh, that Cloud Foundry uses to, to build these applications in. Because um, we didn't show it, you can deploy uh, discrete containers directly, container images, if you allow that permission. Uh, you can deploy those to the Cloud Foundry API, but generally all of these things we're pushing, we're pushing code, they're built on a base container. And there's a, uh, a lot of things that the system does to prevent breakout uh, from those, to prevent um, malicious actors within those. Uh, but um, if you dig down, uh, it's all running in containers and especially in Irene, it's going to depend on uh, how well you've set up um, your Kubernetes cluster to manage that. Hopefully that, that answers it. That's uh, answering it to the best of my ability. Um, uh, we could follow up later if you've got uh, specific questions or if we need more depth there. Yeah. Okay, well, we are actually at the end of the hour. Um, so kind of perfect timing in terms of getting to the questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, and everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we will have news on recording and slides after the presentation. Um, 
Uh, and, um, uh, and otherwise, there will be another webinar tomorrow. Um, which I haven't looked at the schedule to see what the topic is. But there'll be another webinar in this time slot tomorrow uh, for anyone who wants to dial in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Josh. I also want to encourage everyone to uh, just do a last plug to get people to the solution space, the last link in the presentation. I'm sorry, the first link at the top of the page, and that will give, give uh, provide more information. So thanks, all.